Hello kings, queens, nerds, and geeks, Powder Milk here, and welcome back to Fallout Equestria. Now guys, this one's going to be about two hours long. Now I got... Okay, I just noticed this. Uh, if you notice... Okay, you see my pony? The pony next to him? Why is Sour Milk's po pony there? Fuck Sour Milk, why are you invading my videos again? You're messing with my shit again. <sighs> God damn it. Anyway, just ignore Sour for a minute. Anyway guys, um... Welcome back to Fallout Equestria. This one's called Sonic Rad Boom. Now, guys, in the last video, I believe what that was was called a Sonic Rad Boom because based on the name here and what what basically just what 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 um, what she did, I don't know what the fuck happened. Also, guys, do you like my little uh, little setup now? Because uh, well, minus what sour milk put. Why is his pony there? Uh, like, uh, like, here, you guys can see my mouse, right? Right here. What, what is this doing here? What is this doing here? Uh, anyway. Also, uh, guys, um, I have a question before I start. Would you guys want to see Let's Plays of my Fallout? Because I, I did a recent episode on... On uh, Fallout 4, but I'm also willing to do New Vegas and Fallout 3 if you guys want. Oh, fuck, sorry guys. But, would you guys like to see me play Fallout games? That's all I wanted to know. Anyway, just tell me in the comments, and that's all I like. Now, I think we should get right into it, because I'm really curious about what's about to happen. So, ready? Loss. The war had come with thunder and death, and all of the equestrian wasteland seemed in mourning. We were deep in our darkest hour, praying for a ray of light. We had all suffered loss. My friends and I had lost one of our own, Steelhoofs. He had finally found rest, finally been reunited with his beloved Applejack and their child in whatever life lies beyond this. But all I felt was the gaping wound of his absence. An abscess in the core of our party, aching and hollow, where Steelhoofs should have been. The specter of his death hung over everything, casting all of our individual losses into even deeper shadow, making us all seem more vulnerable and fragile. I was struggling with a loss of my very self. I was not who I was anymore. Not little Pip. I was an alien in my own body, a body warped into something entirely not pony by taint. And I was a stranger in my own mind, not knowing the truth of the things I had done. Velvet's words had cut cruelly, not because she was cruel, but because she was right. The Balefire bomb had been an atrocity, and yet, as Velvet had assured me, it had been the necessary thing to do. Without my memories, I didn't know if I had simply never thought of the consequences, or if I had went ahead anyway. Steelhoves had paid the price. He had lost his life because of what I had done. I knew I would never watch those memories. Well, maybe the eighth memory orb. My soul needed homages every healing touch, but certainly not the others. I didn't want to know how much I had realized. If I had committed a holocaust, I couldn't bear it. It would be the final, fatal separation from self. Velvet Remedy was suffering a loss of faith. Velvet was hurting more deeply than the rest of us. The foundation of all she was had been shattered. The wasteland was more cold and cruel and brutal than any pony should have to bear. Too much for a pony whose soul was one filled with kindness and caring for others, whose core desire was to help, to heal, and to make things better. To her, it didn't matter if the hurting creature was a pony, a zebra, or a monster. Friend, stranger, or enemy. All were worthy of the same compassion in Velvet Remedy's eyes. I remembered her considering a hellhound a patient, easing the pain of a dying alicorn. Velvet Remedy had weathered all the equestrian wasteland had thrown at her, sometimes weakening, but never failing in her belief that helping others was the right course of action. And she had done so, fighting both the despair and ugliness of the wasteland, and her own inner demons by clinging to her personal religion of Fluttershy. The kindness of the Mayor of Peace had been her anchor and her bulwark. Now. The memories of Steelhoofs had revealed the truth to Velvet Remedy, and that bulwark was shattered. 
and she was drowning. Calamity was fighting against the loss of all he held dear, and he felt he was losing that battle. Already, one of his friends was dead, and he could see those he held most dear, including the mare he loved, slipping away into their own darkness. All that horror was playing out against the backdrop of the end of his world. After meeting one of Calamity's brothers, and seeing hints that the rest of his family were as bad, or worse, I found Calamity's policy and his personal horror of her buckling cross were brought into sharp focus. Calamity was my closest friend, and I was only now beginning to understand and truly know him. And now the Enclave had descended upon us with Operation Cauterize. It was one thing for Calamity to have rejected and left the Enclave, but it was quite another for him to witness the Enclave rise up as the greatest threat to Equestria. Like us, Applejack's rangers had lost Steelhoofs. He had been their elder and their center, the figure around whom they had gathered. Now, the fledgling force for good faced a harrowing fight to survive. And it wasn't just us. All of the equestrian wasteland was suffering. With the destruction of Canterlot, the ponies of the wasteland had lost the greatest symbol of their fabled past, of the peace and tranquility that was the era before the war. It was as if the final strands of the past had been severed with the death of Steelhoves and the destruction of that city. The proof of what we had once been had carried with it the silent promise that we could, possibly, be that again. Now, we were adrift in a sea of darkness. Within the same day, the wasteland had lost more than an icon. We had lost one of our greatest centers of pony kind with the bloody massacre of Friendship City. We had lost what little peace the wasteland had to offer. We had lost the assurance that even those living within the walls of a fortified city would live another day. All across Equestria, ponies mourned for the dead and feared for the living. As if those wounds were not deep enough, the ponies of the wasteland had lost the voice that called out to them in the darkness, bringing truth and hope, the voice of DJ Pony. But in this, at least, the loss was not absolute. Homage was out there, fighting back and DJ Pony's voice would occasionally cry out within the darkness, bringing a flicker of light before it was silenced. Even our enemies had suffered great loss. The Alicorns had lost their goddess, their guide, their compass. They had lost the unity which connected them and gave them purpose. They had lost the constant voice in their heads to which they had been subservient. Even now, many were beginning to lose their minds. The Hellhounds the most vicious and deadly of all monsters in the wastelands, had the heart of their civilization torn asunder and the bulk of their kind annihilated in a single blast of necromantic green fire. Psychotically territorial, now they no longer had a home of their own. And the Enclave themselves, they had lost one of their leaders and a great many of their ponies in what was, to them, a cowardly and heinous terrorist attack. How much of their overkill was fueled by the rage and grief of a wounded nation? Operation Cauterize was costing them more than they were ready to lose. They had not anticipated the resistance they would encounter, either from without or from within. Their victories had been pyrrhic at best. The Pegasi were facing not only loss of forces and possible defeat, but for many, there was a loss of ideology as well, and it only promised to get worse the longer they stayed here. Of all those in the equestrian wasteland, perhaps only Red Eye had not suffered loss yet. But that would soon change. Loss. It doesn't bring out the best in us, or the worst. Although it can do either. It doesn't show us who we truly are. It just hurts. And it makes us all the same. Even the most sadistic raider, immune to empathy, who draws joy and strength from the suffering of others, will feel grief over the loss they suffer themselves. In the black pit of loss, we all pray for a light. Ditsy do exploded. In this case, this is true. Everything that Pip has said is true. We all suffer some form of loss. Um, I remember in Fallout 4, Kellogg, you'll remember him, uh, if you play the game. Kellogg was the, was the mercenary that worked for the Institute who kidnapped 
the uh, the sole survivor's son, and who is Sean Kellogg. You in the game, you actually end up accessing a part of his uh, hippocampus, and you go through his memories. Uh, you start seeing through his life, and you realize he was near no more mere than a child who suffered from child abuse. It was try to start a family of his own with a wife and daughter. Her still doing mercenary work. He lost his kids to some to, to some raiders. His wife and kids to the raiders. He took revenge. He lived his life as a as a mercenary. Found the institute. End up stealing your kid. And throughout this, he re he uh, sees the world as pointless. But in this, because of this, the way he thinks now is because of his loss of his wife and child. His daughter, his, that is. And everybody suffers a loss no matter how cruel they are. I don't even know how to put words into it. But, uh, and also, I also understand Pip's feelings about her friends at this current moment. Where how it's, it is hurtful to, it, yes, it's painful to feel pain, but it's even more painful to watch others in pain. That's my belief. I can hurt all I want, but I don't want to see others in pain. And the explosion was massive. At the center of the explosion was a glorious greenish gold so bright it seemed to sear my eyes, lingering in my vision for long after I had looked away. From that epicenter erupted a ring of spectral light, riding an enormous shockwave, rippling with strange colors like a toxic rainbow. The missiles chasing Ditsy Doo were bucked backwards, exploding the air yards behind her. Molten payloads discharged in plumes of eldritch hellfire, burning the sky above and below Ditsy Doo. But even as they missed, the force of the twin detonations slammed into the ghoul like she was made of rags. Ditsy Doo's body somersaulted, peppered with shrapnel, and plummeted, unconscious or dead, towards the ground. She was no longer glowing. But the bursts of fire and energy from the missiles were barely noticed in the fury of what Ditsy Doo had unleashed. The ear-splitting crack of her feet drowned out their pitiful explosions, so they were insignificant in comparison. The shockwave blasted through the air, tearing off roofing from the few buildings in New Appaloosa not made of train cars, scattering debris, and tore the Enclave Pegasi out of the sky. Well, there's only one way to clear an area that big that fast, Calamity had told me when I asked about removing part of the cloud curtain. And that's with a sonic rain boom. The realization of what I was seeing struck me, half formed in my brain, as the shockwave knocked the four Enclave Raptors away from the city as the ring of unearthly light washed over them, tearing away their clouds. The Raptors used clouds as integral components for their locks, their computers, structural elements, and the storm clouds that kept them aloft. The mighty Enclave warships crumbled as they fell. Three crashed down just beyond the city's walls. The fourth was not pushed so far away, its corpse dragging towards homes and ponies below, until a caramel-colored field of levitation magic caught it and nudged it away just enough that it struck down on a durable assemblage of boxcars just left of Turnpike Tavern. Even as my mind was putting a name to what I was seeing, I lashed out with my magic, tossing a levitation net under Ditsy Doo's limp body, wrapping her in it. She was falling so fast I knew I would never be able to stop her from splattering against the ground. But I had to try. Two more levitation fields wrapped around my own. A powerful one of that familiar caramel color, and a weak glow of palest silver. Even the three of us could not stop her fall. Only slow her down just a little. Just enough for Calamity to catch her. Even as Calamity burst through our levitation fields, four legs outstretched, the body of Ditsy Doo cradled within them, the shockwave reached the heavens, tearing open the sky. Sunlight, the purest and most brilliant light imaginable, illuminated New Appaloosa in a warm glow. 
It was as if Celestia herself had descended from the heavens and was giving the city a hug. Shimmering colors floated in the air, the heavy storm clouds releasing their moisture as they dissipated. My pip leg began to click with a gentle warning. The rainfall was irradiated, toxic. While I could not see it for myself, I now know how far Ditsidu's miracle had reached. Inside the walls of New Appaloosa, Zenith stood transfixed at the edge of a scrap metal walkway, the hood of her cloak down, her eyes lifted upwards towards the wonder above us. She was too distracted by the marvel above to stop the little lavender filly, her Zenith? newly grown horn glowing with a pale silver light, as she dashed between the zebra's legs, galloping towards hold where Calamity was just Zenith now landing. is alive. Yes! Oh, thank you. Thank you. Zenith is alive. So is the so is the child. Uh. Oh, thank you. Uh. But her ears caught the filly's cry. Mommy. Ditsy Do's sonic radiation boom did not stop at the edges of New Appaloosa. I spun, watching the expanding ring of Ditsy Do's explosion a rainbow of glorious and diseased colors tearing outward, riding the shockwave that carried dust and detritus with it like a storm. The sonic radiation boom blasted over the ever-free forest, clearing the smoke and fanning the flames that didn't blow out. The shockwave rattled the windows of the cathedral. I'm sure that, in that moment, Red Eye paused to look up into the sky, realizing something important had just happened. The blast was felt all the way in Ponyville, driving the beleaguered town's nearest inhabitants underground. The toxic rainbow flashed over Splendid Valley, driving a great radioactive wind before it. A wash of strange light fanned out beneath the clouded sky. Looking up from the gravestone before which she was grieving, a charcoal-coated unicorn watched the light mirrored across the lake behind Steelhoof's shack. The thundering crack of the sonic radboom echoed through the gray canyons of the Manhattan ruins. Staring out through his office window in Tempony Tower, a mottled brown unicorn with a scroll on his flank watched as sunlight spilled down on a town far away, the golden glow reflecting in his glasses. Even amongst the cold, windswept crags of Shattered Hoof Ridge, where the storm clouds were unleashing a flurry of summer snow, the glow of Ditsy Doo's sonic radiation boom was visible on the monitors inside the base station of the Shattered Hoof Ridge Tower, lighting up part of the horizon in a pulse of weird luminescence. Oh. It and me. just outside of town, this little you. I don't know why, but the sin sudden realization. I don't know what all this has pertained to this, but I remembered. Uh, I, I was thinking about taint over when I was playing Fallout, guys, and um, when I was thinking about it, and I thought about it for a moment, and I realized that, and of course the uh, the, the super mutants are related to the uh, alicorns. And, um, I just realized that taint is the equivalent to the FEV virus. I don't know why I didn't take the two to two together, but that's basically what it is. The unicorn mare with a pit buck on her flank was finally feeling the pieces of that great puzzle slide into place in her head. I had spent my life searching for who I was, trying to find meaning in my existence. As a filly, I yearned to discover my key to mark needing to know what made me different and special, if anything at all. Outside, my search evolved into a quest to find my virtue, and ultimately, my place in this vast and cruel wasteland. Now, in the light given to us by Ditsy Doo, I began to see. As each piece slid slowly into place, they began to reveal to me what I had spent my life longing for. Purpose. I levitated myself over the wall of New Appaloosa. I didn't care if I was banned from the city. Not now. Calamity had landed just inside, cradling Ditsy Doo. My heart was screaming. I didn't know if she was alive or dead. I had already lost Steelhoofs two days ago. I didn't think I could bear to lose another friend. Not so soon. I landed on the puddle-covered ground inside and galloped towards where Calamity sat on a set of railroad tracks, bathed in sunlight, Ditsy Doo's body resting in his forelegs. And there was Icar bleeding from innumerable small wounds. 
Silver Bell and Xanath were gathered close to him, and others were beginning to circle. If Railwright wanted to kick me out, let him try. My heart was pounding as I reached Calamity, my eyes filling with tears as I watched the Pegasus ghoul, praying to Celestia and Luna for any sign of movement, any sign of life. My mind flashed to Velvet Remedy, holding steel hooves, and the sobs started. The rain out felt strange against my coat, but the warmth and true light of the sun was too majestic to take cover inside. My gaze drifted upwards to the crystalline blue of the hole above us, a yawning upness that went on. This reminds me, when, uh, when Little Pip praised the Celestia and Lona, that reminded me of a particular character in Fallout. Um, I don't remember his exact name, but I do know that he was called the Burned Man in Fallout New Vegas. And I, I remember how he always talked about God. I, 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 the way he would talk about God while he was uh, checking his weapons. I remember the motion he would do. He would go... He'd do that motion repeatedly, which bugged me. But I remember him talking about, how, about his God. He didn't care whether you believed. He didn't care... Er, er, about anything else but, you know, trying to be good in the eyes of God. And that's why he left the Legion, I think. Well, regardless, that, I, I know it's off topic, but that's what it reminded me of. Forever. Unlike that starry night sky which I had first glimpsed through breaks in the clouds on my first wasteland night, this sky was wonderful and embracing inspiring none of the terror I had felt before. No. I whimpered softly to myself and to the goddesses. Please no. She has to be alive. She has to see this. She deserves to see this. The ponies of New Appaloosa were coming out of the homes and shops where they had taken refuge. They were all staring up at the sky, seeing sunlight for the first time in their lives. Many seemed shell-shocked, but slowly they also began to smile. A few specks of color swirled through the bright blue above. Some began drifting downward, chasing each other. Pegasus ponies from the world above the cloud curtain, drawn by the phenomenon. What? What just happened? I heard a buck ask somewhere to my left. I think Ditsy Doo just saved us, a mare responded. I watched those pegasi fly down toward the new Appaloosa. Hesitant. Curious. The brightly colored pegasi didn't look like Enclave ponies. They didn't wear the dark colors of the Enclave, nor move like they intended to attack. They ain't bad ponies, little Pip. Calamity's voice whinnied in my memory. If most of the ponies up there saw for themselves what's going on down here, they'd buck the damn Enclave and pony up to help. I hope so, I thought, my eyes falling back towards Ditsy Doo. Silverbell had stepped forward, and was nudging her gently, whimpering. Poke. Ow. Mommy? Mommy? Goddesses, please, no. Behind me, a young colt's voice called out. Ma, did you see it? Did you see it? Derpy saved us. And Derpy's hurt. Yes, I know, Trolley, the colt's mother said softly. I saw... She deserves to see this. I cried out in prayer, my vision blurring badly as Ditsy Doo continued not to move. Please, she deserves to see this. A shift. A slight fluttering of her eyes. One rolled to meet Silverbell. Then Ditsy Doo whispered something, almost unintelligible, but that sounded to me, despite her missing tongue, a lot like, Sorry, love. Mommy's sleepy. I collapsed, crying harder than ever. But now the sobs were of relief and joy. She was still alive. Mommy! Silverbell jumped and hugged the ichor-coated ghoul fiercely. Unable to lift her forehooves, the pegasus limply wrapped her wings around the rapturous filly. Mommy! The little unicorn gushed happily. You made everything so pretty! Sunlight poured over us. Towards the horizon behind us, the toxic rainbow was breaking up and fading away. 
Silverbell had climbed up onto Ditsydew, her hoof slipping past the ichor bleeding out of the dying Pegasus's many wounds. I had wrapped her in a magical cocoon, and was floating both of them towards Ditsydew's store, where Pyrelight was perched just outside on a rain barrel. We just need to get her inside, I was thinking. Lay her down next to Pyrelight. Find some bandages. There'll be bandages inside. There has to be. It's absolutely everything. I am sorry, Zenith was saying. I tried to keep her inside, but your daughter can be evasive. Are you coming home now, Mommy? Which is weird Silver for Zenith. Silverbell begged. And honestly. Miss Zenith is okay, but she's not a mommy. The little filly lowered her voice, whispering into a ragged, ghoulish ear. And she's kind of creepy. Zenith's eyes widened just a moment, then coated with steel as she gazed away. Silverbell's words becoming another brick in her conviction that she was unfit to be a mother to her own child. I winced a little. I knew Silverbell meant no cruelty. I could only imagine how strange and remote Zenith had been. She was still wearing her zebra stealth cloak, after all. I imagined she spent most of her time with the filly invisible to avoid trouble with the town's ponies. But those words had done damage nevertheless. Looking askance, Zenith offered. Have you considered training her in the Fallen Kaisar style? I found myself wondering about Zenith's upbringing and her former tribe that had her response to an evasive child was to suggest honing those natural talents with an art of killing and incapacitation. Ditsy Doo dismissed the offer with a shake of her head, and hugged Silverbell close again with her wings. My pip leg was still clicking, but I couldn't tell if the radiation was from the Pegasus ghoul or the puddles of irradiated water. I suspected that Ditsy Doo was still shedding some minor levels of radiation, even after the sonic rain boom but not at the levels which threatened the unicorn filly. Nothing that ran away, ugh, wouldn't cure. And right now, they needed to be able to hold each other. The click-clicking jumped as Pyrelight landed next to my head. Unwilling to wait for us to get inside, the Balefire Phoenix began bathing the wounded ghoul in a golden-green radiation. Nah, uh Silverbell insisted, responding to Zenith's offer. I'm gonna be a painter, see? The lavender filly pointed, and my eyes followed her hoof. One of the nearby boxcar houses had a crude but colorful portrait of New Appaloosa painted across it. This wall has a mural. I cantered in a circle, really seeing New Appaloosa for the first time since my last visit. The painting was not alone. The child's paintings decorated many of the train cars around me as well as barrels, carts, and anything else that the folk of New Appaloosa wouldn't mind Silverbell beautifying. I could see the progression of her skills from one storefront to the next. Between the sunlight and the colors of her paints, the town felt more inviting than any place in the wasteland. The light sparkled off of irradiated puddles. The warmth of the sun massaged me through my coat. I could feel the bright rays touch my soul, the sunlight breaking through my defenses all the clouds of pain and loss that layered my heart. The breath of the sun rekindled hope, and made all the darkness of the day before seem bearable. My heart twinged, wishing Steelhoofs was here with us, wanting him to see this. A gruff-looking pony with a spiked mane and a cutie mark of a skull impaled on a bloody dagger galloped past me, a shotgun in his mouth. My gaze followed him as he reached one of the fallen enclave pegasi. She was just starting to get back up, and the buck reached her, rearing up. Now thinking about it, there are very few ponies in the equestrian laced land that have seen the sunlight. All of them, all the pegasi, that are all the dashite pegasi have. Then there are, then there's steel hooves, who is pre all the pre steel hooves and all pre war ghouls such as Ditsy. And uh, of course, ve of course. Uh, of course, Twilight's mom. I can never remember her name. Velvet Sparkle or something? I don't know. Um, but, um... Who else? Well, usually those people are the ones who see the sunlight. Of course, Spike's probably seen the sunlight. 
and what else? I don't know exactly, but there are very few who have seen sunlight in the equestrian lace land. You got to think about that for a moment. Like, that is like very rare. And now the widespread of sunlight has been extended to, the, to New Appaloosa and anybody around the area. Now they have seen sunlight for the first time. Hmm. And slamming his hooves onto her head, driving her back against the ground. And stay down. The Pegasus's visor was broken, and I could see her purple eyes staring upwards at him in shock. The buck leveled the shotgun at one of the Pegasus's wings, keeping a hoof on her head and an eye on her deadly tail. I heard a clatter of metal as another Pegasus in ominous black carapace armor emerged from a pile of rubble that ten minutes ago had been a tool shed. Shadows blocked the sunlight above me as three more Enclave soldiers flew in over the wall and hovered overhead. All of New Appaloosa stood in silent awe of the sun. Foles and the elderly were stepping out of their homes to marvel at the sky. But the Enclave Pegasi had lived above the clouds all their lives. They had grown numb to the warmth and wonder of the sun, forgotten how to notice it. All they saw was the town that had once again struck them a devastating blow. This battle wasn't over. I crouched in the doorway of absolutely everything as beams of colorful light struck the door frame and dissolved Ditsy Doo's front door into a mound of slag. The heat coming off of the melting door seared my coat. Outside the door was chaos. We were fighting in the sunlight. It felt terribly wrong. Disgraceful. The little pony in my head worried, hoping that good ponies of the town would not come to associate something so generous as sunlight with the ugly herd of battle. I fumbled telekinetically, trying to get my ear bloom into my ear as I fired back with little Macintosh. Applejack's trusty revolver was the only firearm I had left. I realized with a twinge of loss that both my sniper rifle and the zebra rifle were still sitting in a crate somewhere in Manhattan, if they hadn't been looted already. Mission objective has not changed. A stallion's voice boomed over the Enclave's military frequency. I was almost certain it had to be coming from one of the downed raptors. New Appaloosa was being attacked by dozens of Enclave soldiers, rather than hundreds, suggesting that either the Pegasi and those raptors were trapped inside, or that beyond the city walls, the Enclave were having internal struggles. We are here to disinfect equestria of this terrorist encampment. Fly steady, soldiers. For the Council. For the Enclave. The black-armored Pegasus darted behind an overturned pedal trolley. One of my bullets splashed into a puddle behind her, another burying itself into the trolley's woodwork. The Pegasus flapped her wings, rising up to fire again. Ditsy Doo's Griffin bodyguard had produced a lightning rifle and disappeared upstairs. Calamity was further inside the store along with Pyrelite, both tending to Ditsy Doo as Silverbell fetched medical supplies. I glanced back to see the Lavender Philly balanced precariously on several boxes as she tried to reach a key sitting on an upper shelf. I caught the Philly and the key as the whole shelf came tumbling down, spilling cameras and teddy bears everywhere. Distracted, I gave the attacking Pegasus an easy shot, and she took it. I grunted in pain as part of my flank barding heated up, but the Canterlot police barding protected me from severe injury. Crack! White lightning arced out of a second floor window above me. The Pegasus mare screamed as she dropped, her magically powered armor fried. The mare was probably alive, but without its spell matrix, her armor was too heavy to move in. Beyond, I could see the bodies of the raider-like buck and the purple-eyed enclave pegasus. They lay together, having traded lethal blows. Her purple eyes stared out lifelessly. His body was still impaled with the blade of her tail. Trolley, get inside now! The voice came from somewhere outside and to my left. I slipped outside of the doorway, instantly alarmed. I'd seen too many foals die. The weight of the bottle of ashes pressed against me through one of my saddlebags. I wouldn't let anything happen to this little colt. Trolley's mother, whose straw sun hat and floral dress were soaked with irradiated rain, stood protectively between her colt and one of the Enclave soldiers. She had no weapon, but she stood firm, 
shielding her cold as he leapt up from where he was cowering behind her legs and ran for the nearest open door. I took aim with a pegasus as the magical weapons on the Enclave Buck's armor crackled. Please, can't I just go a single day without having to kill another pony? The little pony in my head pleaded sadly with the wasteland. A streak of blue and white struck the ground between the mother and the buck, just as the Enclave soldier fired. A white pegasus with a mane and tail and a multitude of blues had landed, facing the Enclave soldier with her mouth open. The sentence dying before it could be spoken as one of the beams of lethal energy struck her square in the breast, the other searing through the mother's sun hat, blasting it into ash. Mm. Blam! Blam! Click. A shot staggered the Enclave Pegasus, one of the bullets piercing his armor, as the white Pegasus mare crumbled to the ground. From her distressed breathing, the shot had torn and possibly vaporized one of her lungs. I found myself calling out for Velvet Remedy before I realized that she wasn't with us anymore. The Enclave Pegasus froze for a moment, staring through his visor at the mewling white Pegasus, stunned. Commander, we have citizens here! Another voice called out over the Enclave's military frequency. Suggest withdrawal for a Shutterfly operation. I scrambled back behind cover, reloading little Macintosh as a familiar khaki-coated buck with a vanilla mane raced out of a nearby train car and fell to the side of the white pegasus. One of the trio of young heroes whom we had met at Fluttershy's cottage. Some pony helped me get her to candy! Sparks and the ring of metal on metal erupted across the Pegasus buck as he came under fire from a rooftop. I looked up to see a scarred, maneless mare in raider armor firing railroad spikes from what looked like a homemade steam-powered rifle. The town's mayor, Railwright, had taken cover behind an overturned workbench, a bundle of spikes between his teeth, prepared to reload. More voices poured through my ear bloom. Meeting unexpected resistance. Not like previous encampments. There are foals here. Families. The Enclave soldier pivoted towards them, opening fire. A second black-armored pegasus swooped overhead, raining a cluster of magical energy grenades down on the mayor. I focused, magically redirecting the grenades back up to the attacker. They exploded with a frenzy of multicolored light, ripping the pegasus bomber apart in the air. Blood and entrails splattered down on rail right. I felt nauseous. There's a lot of shit the going on. Bloody white intestines glistened in the sunlight. This is Commander Winter of the Raptor Nimbo Stratus. Remember, these are the terrorists who supplied Red Eye with the mega spell used to murder hundreds of Enclave citizens in their cowardly sneak attack. The unprovoked slaughter of Harbinger and so many of our brothers and sisters is a day that will forever burn in infamy. The voice on the Enclave command frequency growled. I was struck by the dichotomy between what they told their own soldiers and the propaganda they polluted the equestrian wasteland with. And their flagrant use of illegal and horrific war tactics shall today only f mm. and their use of flagrant mm. and their flagrant use of illegal and horrific warfare tactics today shall only strengthen our resolve. More of my Canterlot police barding heated. Not to point it out out my f uh Crazy ramblings, but uh, he kind of had a little stutter there. I'm not judging. I have stutter too. Like I have that problem too. That's why I can't read fan fiction out loud that much. It, the top layer is melting as two magical energy bolts struck me. Another hit Ditsy Do sign. Yes, I do deliveries. Obliterating her offer of free wasteland survival guides. Searching for the source of the attack. I spotted the Pegasus in black armor landing on the balcony around Turnpike Tavern. Some pony else had spotted her too, as a green field of telekinetic energy wrapped around the Pegasus, lifting her up and twirling her around. The little pony in my head winced, realizing the unicorn's mistake a moment before the Pegasus spread her wings and pushed herself out of the telekinetic sheath with a single flap. Spinning her about had merely helped the targeting spell in her armor locate and lock onto the offending new Appolution. And, even as my own targeting spell locked onto her, the Pegasus vaporized the surprised unicorn with a rapid-fire light show from her integrated magical energy minigun. Blam, 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 blam. I squeezed little Macintosh's trigger as quickly as I could. Several of the bullets were stopped by the Pegasus's black carapace, 
but one struck home in her wing. The Pegasus lost control of her flight, spinning wildly before crashing into the new Appalachian crane with a sickening crunch. Fly steady. The Enclave Pegasus rebounded from the metal neck of the crane and crashed to the ground below. My eyes traveled upwards along the crane to the platform it held, dangling high above the city. A platform stacked with railroad rails. Some pony else had a similar idea. Caramel-colored magic flashed across the bolts beneath one side of the platform, and the chain snapped free, the platform swinging down and dumping the mass of rails onto the Pegasus, just as she was getting back to her hooves. The sound of those heavy metal beams striking the ground and metal rolled across New Appaloosa like the percussion from Hell's own orchestra. I cringed away, covering my own ears. And do not forget that your actions here make your brothers and sisters, your families back home, safe once red... What are... The transmission in my ear bloom suddenly went dead. Out of the corner of my eye, I spotted a unicorn mare weeping over a fallen guard buck. I saw her expression shift from inconsolable loss to red rage as an enclave soldier landed in the street nearby, nuzzling the unmoving body of another armored pegasus. I knew what was about to happen. My little pony cried out a warning that never made it to my lips as the unicorn floated the dead buck's machine gun battle saddle into the air took aim, and fired. The first bullet struck true, puncturing the Enclave soldier's armor and scrambling his insides. But the kick of the battle saddle knocked it out of the mare's magical hold. The gun sprang wildly, several bullets ripping through the poor unicorn herself. She stood, blood pouring down her side and flank, her eyes wide with a look of uncomprehending surprise for at least three long seconds after the battle saddle had clattered to the ground beneath her. Then she swayed and fell over the body of the guard buck she had been mourning, the life fleeing from her eyes. Death was breathing over New Appaloosa. The Grim Reaper ponies were having a feast. Stop it! Calamity cried out, shooting through the doorway past me as two more Enclave soldiers flew over, firing swaths of burning plasma into the streets below, drawn out by the screams of ponies burning alive in agony. Calamity's voice was filled with rage and sorrow, sounding heartbreakingly fragile as he bellowed. Horrified, I commanded my targeting spell to ignore hostiles, and instead locking on to friendly targets. The ponies in those plasma fires could not be saved. I couldn't bear to let them suffer. I wished Velvet Remedy was here, yearning for her anesthetic spell. But all I could offer were bullets. Blam. Blam. My targeting spell allowed me to perfectly aim through the flames. One shot each, to the head. It was mercy, but I hated myself for it. I felt like my coat was writhing, wanting to crawl off of my body in disgust. Attention, Enclave personnel! A new mare's voice burst into my ear as the Enclave military frequency crackled to life again. This is Acting Commander Red Glare of the Raptor Nimbostratus. Commander Winters has been relieved of his command. As of this moment, you take your orders from me. The fury of the battle waned a moment, many Enclave soldiers pausing to listen and reload. This battle is over. I'm invoking the Shutterflight Protocol. All Enclave forces are to withdraw immediately and assist. And just like that, it was over. The Enclave soldiers stopped. They turned their heads to the sunny blue of the sky above, and then, almost as one, flew upwards and away from us, like demons fleeing hell. It took the ponies of New Appaloosa several minutes to stop firing at them, but the Pegasi were fast, and all but one had managed to get out of range before the townsfolk could strike them down from below. That single mare came pirouetting downwards like a falling shadow. She hit a rain barrel, smashing it her blood tinting the irradiated water as it rushed away from her. I fell against the doorway, my strength leaving me. My revulsion and horror gave way to a numbness that felt even worse. Beneath that numbness, I realized I was shaking. Ditsy Doo had saved New Appaloosa. Without her, this town would have been nothing but a smoking crater. But all around me, the dead and the crying drove home that this victory was not without grievous loss. 
I watched Calamity land next to the fallen white Pegasus with the fantastic blue hair. Her side was rising and falling. She was struggling to breathe, but still alive. As I watched, I noticed that she had a... Mm, <laughs> as I watched, I noticed that she wore a belt strap with a pit buck dangling from it. It was locked closed, undoubtedly taken from the corpse of a previous owner. Unable to open it or wear it herself, she had slung it over her like it was a canteen. Calamity helped the khaki pony slide her onto a piece of sheet metal and carry her towards Candy's clinic. There were several more ponies converging on the same building. Candy had already run out of room inside and was directing every pony to line up the wounded on the porch surrounding her clinic. I shifted my gaze away, looking into the darkness of absolute everything. Ditsy Doo's griffin bodyguard was still perched in the upstairs window, watching the ascending pegasi like a hawk. Or, well, a griffin. Alarm shot through me as I realized no pony was tending to Ditsy Doo. I could see her in the back, illuminated by pyrolet's glow, unmoving. Unmoving is okay, right? The little pony in my head asked frantically. It doesn't mean anything. Ghouls don't move much. Steelers would stand still for hours. Goddesses. Steel hooves. Silverbell was sitting beside the ghoul's cot, the balefire phoenix wrapped in her forelegs. The little pony in my head stopped crying over my lost ranger long enough to wince, remembering just how unhealthy that was for the filly. I prayed to the goddesses that Ditsy Doo hadn't lost her entire supply of rat away when her delivery wagon was annihilated. I tried to pull myself to my hooves, intending to gallop over to them but my legs refused to bear my weight. I glanced at my medical display on my EFS, believing that I hadn't been wounded that badly in the battle. My armor had protected me, yes. But I was exhausted, emotionally brutalized, and I hadn't slept since long before the funeral. At the moment, the light of the sun was the only thing giving me the spiritual strength and energy to keep going, and even that had been spoiled. And then, the light began to dim. I lifted my gaze towards the skies. Far above, the Enclave Pegasi were zooming back and forth across the circle of blue above us, drawing parallel lines of clouds across the opening. Strangely, I remembered an old story about skaters scoring the ice during winter wrap-up. But then, as the thin lines of cloud began to thicken, expanding towards each other, filling the gaps of blue between, I realized it looked a lot more like some ponies slowly closing the blinds over a window. The Pegasi were locking up the sun again. Shutterflight. My thoughts felt warm and melancholy, and slightly fuzzy, like little teddy bears that I wanted to hug as I went to sleep. Medical treatment at Candy's was one part butterscotch rum. Calamity had found me collapsed in the doorway, trying to worm my way towards Ditsy Doo, and had insisted on hauling me to the clinic. I had protested. I wasn't wounded enough to warrant taking attention away from other ponies. But I hadn't needed to worry. I had been given a cot about half a block from the overfilled clinic, been stripped of my barding, and had been given a canteen of healing that smelled strongly of butterscotch. The sounds of moans and crying drifted over me like layers of smoke. The air smelled like alcohol, blood, and burnt flesh. In the cot next to me was an elderly green-coated earth pony. He had stepped outside to see the sun only to have his hind leg melted. Candy was telling his plaintive grandchildren that their grandpappy was in a deep sleep and might not wake up again for a long time. The young filly wrapped her forelegs around the slightly younger colt and held him as she broke into sobs. I wanted to sob too. For steel hooves. For velvet. For the little filly whose ashes I kept in a jar. For ditsy do, even though I still had hope she would survive this and for all those who did not. But I couldn't. I was too tired to cry. And there were too many ponies around. The little pony in my head told me that pain, grieving, was a private thing. I could cry with calamity, or with homage, but not here in front of all of these ponies. Calamity laid down next to me, staring to the dirt, his hat tilted sadly. He wasn't crying, not externally at least, but my friend couldn't hide his pain. My heart reached out for him in a way my legs refused to. We'll fix this, I assured him. 
Calamity stirred. He didn't look at me. Instead, he looked towards the row of pony-shaped lumps under stained sheets. You can't fix dead. His voice was flat, defeated. I wanted to bury my head, hide away from that voice. My mind conjured the image of steel hooves walking solemnly amongst the sheet-covered bodies, bearing solemn witness to the fallen. He should be here, my little pony mourned. Then my cruel imagination envisioned steel hooves as one of the bodies underneath of those sheets. I choked on a breath and had to look away. I gazed over at Candy, my eyes tracing the white earth pony in her yellow and pink striped nurse's dress. I had fancied her once, and she was indeed fanciable, but now I only regretted that she was not Velvet Remedy, whose skills were badly needed here. Or homage. That was a selfish wish, but I allowed myself to have it anyway. Homage could heal and comfort me far more than the canteen of weak healing mixtures and rum. Homage was my son. Her mere presence would warm me. Her soft words would banish the dark shadows in my head. Her tongue would... My thoughts were interrupted by the approach of Railwright. The gray and black stallion was accompanied by the bald, scarred mare I had seen with him before. Don't, don't try to pass that off real quick. I heard that. I heard that. Um, as much as this is sad right now, that was sturdy as hell, and I love that. <laughs> Seriously, add a dirty joke in any situation, it's going to make me laugh. God, I'm a pervert. Her raider armor revealed just enough to make out her cutie mark, a black needle-like dagger dripping in blood. My eyes narrowed. You gave Red Eye the Balefire Bomb. I spat as he approached me, opening his muzzle to proclaim something. His muzzle snapped shut abruptly. The air between us felt brittle and charged with tense, unseen energy. Calamity stood up, leveling a dark look at the mayor pony. The bald pony cut in, either oblivious to the discord between myself and the mayor, or unable to give a shit. Wow, I get you now, she announced. Feels damn good to be a goddess damned heroine for once. Fight on the side of the angels and all that. Who the hell are you? I groused. She looked like a raider. Sounded like one, too. Stiletto. She grinned savagely. Shattered of raiders. Although I guess we ain't raiders no more. We're protecting the waste for fun and profit. God's ponies. Shattered hoof was- That sounds like One Punch Man. Like, I know this is like, long before One Punch Man even existed. This sounded like One Punch Man! What punch? Tiring out mercenaries. Meshed with the spike mane pony I had seen earlier, and Ditsy Do's Griffin bodyguard. Last I knew, God had been consolidating her forces, but also contemplating what to do with the bad eggs amongst them. Maybe this was her solution for those ex-raiders not vile or untrustworthy enough to meet her talons, but still undesirable to have around the house. And y'all blew it up for him, Railwright said stonily. He threatened homage with that bomb, I hissed. Then, realizing the name meant nothing to him, he threatened all of Ten Pony Tower. Thousands of ponies. Your actions put me in a rather tight spot. I needed to show Red Eye that New Appaloosa weren't against him. Railwright glowered a moment before glancing around. Besides, would you prefer we kept an undetonated balefire bomb sitting here in town? No pony would do that. That'd be insane. I felt my nerves jangle with energy. Despite my exhaustion, it was taking extreme effort, be pleasant, not to put a hoof through his face. Besides, it'd seem y'all working for Red Eye anyways, Railwright whispered. The stallion smiled oddly. From wiping out his slavers to wiping out his enemies. I couldn't have seen that one coming. Extreme effort. Calamity bristled, neighing warningly. And he seems to have plans for you, too. Can I punch right him? Can I reach into Stiletto the story? Had apparently grown bored. She trotted away, sitting down and sharpening the spikes on her I arm. want to literally reach into the story... And punch this guy in the face. Her eyes watching the skies. What do you mean, Railwright? 
I asked, not sure I wanted the answer. Railwright shrugged. Not sure, <coughs> but I've come to tell you that y'all are welcome back in New Appaloosa, he told me. No point in keeping out when Red Eye considers you an asset. Not to mention how unpopular that decision has made me amongst the DJ Pony loving herd. Railwright grumbled. I'm rather lucky to still be mayor around here. Stiletto clopped over and poked the mayor with a forehoof. Griffin's inbound. Looks like the big boss. I turned my eyes to the sky. The cloud cover had been completely restored. With over a hundred pegasi working on it, the breach had been sealed in under half an hour, casting the wasteland once more into the heavy gloom. A far-off flash lit up the underside of the storm clouds, echoed by a second flash a little closer. This flash illuminated a flock of griffins, two smaller ones flanking the flock leader as she guided them towards New Appaloosa. Heavy raindrops began to fall. Cold, clean water sprinkled from the blackened clouds above. Raindrops rippled the surface of the irradiated puddles, broadening and diluting them. The soft metallic clatter as the rain beat upon the metal boxcars sounded like funeral drums. The rainstorm that the sky had been threatening began slowly. But soon, Candy was corralling every volunteer she could to move the wounded inside before they were completely soaked. Calamity moved to one end of my cot, then stopped, glowering at Railright and Stiletto. One of you is gonna grab the other end and make sure we get into absolutely everything, or well, so help me. Yeah, 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 Stiletto quipped before picking up the opposite end in her teeth. You're a tough buck. Very impressed and shit. Shaking even. I wasn't alone in my trip to Ditsy's. Absolutely everything had one of the larger interiors in New Appaloosa, and over a half dozen cots were floated, carried, or dragged inside within minutes. Well, that was an anti-shortcut, I mumbled as my cot was placed near the doorway to Ditsy Doo's room. The ghoul didn't look like she had moved yet. Silverbell was curled up on top of her, sleeping fitfully. An emptied packet of Radaway lay on the floor beneath them a little bit of the glowing orange juice dribbling from the sleeping filly's muzzle. Otherwise, Pilot's radioactive glow ensured that Dizzy Doo had the room to herself. She can be okay? I asked Pyrelight. I was surrounded by ponies, yet there was no one else to ask. The Zenith had disappeared again. The softly glowing bird hooted gently. And once more, I wished Velvet Remedy was here. I wasn't sure she would be any better with ghoul physiology, but at least she could interpret Pyrelite's musical notes for me. I felt a hoof punch my shoulder. Why didn't you tell us who you were? I turned to see the amber mare and the khaki buck whom we had held back at Fluttershy's cottage. The attacking hoof was from the mare, who managed to look both starstruck and cross at the same time. I found myself blushing and the little pony in my head quickly insisted the extra heat in my cheeks was from the rum, and definitely not from embarrassment, or being hit by a pretty mare. Ah, yes, the canteen. I should drink more now. Easier than responding. Yep. I was gushing all about the wasteland heroine, and you were right there and didn't say anything, the mare protested. Why was she mad at me? I'm not. I tried to argue. I mean, I'm just trying to do the right thing, like any pony would. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the mare chimed, rolling her eyes. Like any pony would, because just any pony would risk their life trotting to the home of the most dangerous monsters in Equestria and set off a bale fire bomb and clear them out. She smirked. My eyes widened. My muscles stiffened in alarm. What? How? You know, but... I felt my words stumbling over each other. Of course every pony knew. DJ Pony had seen to that. But that wasn't something I should be praised for. Yeah, the buck added. The way I see it, you can't have an undetonated megaspell bomb in the wasteland without some evil asshole using it to murder a fuck ton of ponies. I flinched. But not only did you get rid of it so it couldn't be used to hurt any pony, but you wiped out... What? Hundreds? Thousands of monsters that hunt ponies for sport? His voice oozed sarcasm as he added. Yeah, just like any pony would have done, right? 
My mind reeled. I felt as if my world had been nudged off axis. I felt messed up. The memory of what I had done merged into a vision of Steelho standing on erupting ground and slashing claws that tore through his armor, severing his neck. The stallion three cots away from me woke up and began to scream, thrashing violently. Two bucks moved to hold him down, while Calamity pulled painkillers from Ditsy Doo's stock, tossing bottle caps onto her counter. Beneath the stallion's screams, I heard Mayor Railwright announcing that Ditsy Doo's medical stock was being confiscated for emergency use. The little pony in my head stomped at that. I couldn't imagine any pony, much less Ditsy Doo, trying to sell medicine at a time like this. But I still wanted the mayor to ask for permission. Not that he could. The door banged open, letting in a spray of rain as two colorful, unarmored pegasi pushed into the crowded store. The stallion's screams began to weaken as Calamity jabbed him with a syringe full of painkiller and pushed the plunger slowly with a hoof. One by one, the other ponies turned to stare, their conversations dropped to a hushed tones or dying away. In one corner, a wife continued to sob over her bloodily bandaged husband, but even she stole a look. I'm sure they brought her in here. The first Pegasus, a sunflower yellow mare with an excessively curly crimson mane and a smiling sun for a cutie mark, said before stopping, her eyes widening at the stare she was receiving. Behind her, a buck with a coat the color of jade and a short cropped teal mane looked like he was about to drag her back out by her poofy tail. Are you crazy? he hissed, trying to keep his voice low, but it carried anyway. They're gonna kill you. They've already probably killed her. For all you know, this is their kitchen. The mare gave a nervous smile, a bead of sweat falling from her forehead as she looked over the staring unicorn and earth ponies. She lifted a hoof and a timid wave as she threw a harsh whisper back at her companion. Hey, knock it off. They can hear you. The amber mare next to me stomped and nickered. I'm rethinking that thing about how pegasuses are all cool. The Pegasus mare's eyes looked back and forth over the room before coming to rest on a nearby bookshelf. School special. All pencils and notepads 50% off. She read softly before turning to her companion. Not a kitchen. Unless you think they're offering a hearty school filly salad with a scrumptious pencil cobbler for dessert. I heard a few grudging chuckles. To me, the comment just brought up disquieting visions of Arbu. They're joking about eating fillies? The khaki buck breathed, appalled. They're joking about what they think we're like, the amber mare answered. At the door, the jade-colored buck took the pegasus mare's mane in his teeth and gave her a tug. We need to go, now, he insisted with a stomp. The air's poisonous down here, remember? She'll be dead before she can fly again. Hell, we're probably already dead. I'm not dead yet, a weak voice called out. A white hoof raised into the air. I shifted to spot the wounded white pegasus. And according to my pit buck, the air's not poisonous, tracker. Oh, of course it's poisonous, the jade pegasus tracker spat back. You're using that thing wrong. You always have. They don't work when you ain't wearing them. Actually, I wanted to interject, feeling a moment of pride in my expertise. Radiation monitoring would still work, and just like the radio. Although, admittedly, health monitoring wouldn't. My thoughts fell apart before the desire could manifest as more than a vague wish. Between the medicine and my exhaustion, I was flirting with incoherency. If the air was poisonous, the yellow pegasus challenged, how come all these ponies are still alive? Uh, they grew resistant to it, obviously, the buck shot back. Don't you ever listen to the science station. Their argument was interrupted by a rust-colored pegasus in a black desperado hat. One, Calamity said authoritatively. There sure shit are places where the air is poisonous, but this ain't one of them. And two, y'all can't go back anyway, so best be thankful for that. The buck's eyes widened in alarm, then narrowed. The white pegasus gasped. What do you mean we can't go back? She wheezed. I've got to go back. Those soldiers were attacking unarmed civilian ponies. Elderly and foals. When my senator hears about this... When her what now? 
Calamity turned towards her, his expression gentle and a touch remorseful, but his voice firm. The Enclave has seen y'all down here by now. Reported it. Y'all were on the wrong side of a shuttle flight, and have interacted with the locals too. Unofficially, y'all are contaminated. Calamity informed them sadly. Officially, y'all are probably dead already. Don't listen to him, the Jade Pegasus blurted out. By the weekend, the Enclave will have delivered condolences and new birth approval certificates to your families, Calamity continued. Sunglint, morning frost, don't listen. Tracker pushed forward. A few of the ambulatory new evolutions stood up and took a step towards him in response. He's a dashite. His words are all lies and infectious ideas. Calamity turned to Tracker, unwavering. Just trying to tell it like it is. Save you the heartache of trying to go back. You think I don't recognize you? Tracker accused. You dead shot Calamity. You murdered your troops and fled beneath the clouds to escape punishment. I've seen your wanted poster before. Calamity sighed slightly, glancing back towards me as he muttered under his breath. History rewritten again. Looking back at the buck, my friend said reasonably, Look, believe what you want to believe, but trust me when I say you don't want to be heading back. He looked at the two Pegasus mares. That's fucked up. That's seriously fucked up. You just judge someone because he's a Dashite. Because he decided to rebel against your government that you solemnly believe. See, here's this. I don't really care what other countries do with their government. Like, if that's what they want to do, that's what they want to do. But you shouldn't judge other people's form or... Uh, go uh, government of choice. If they decide to leave your country to try to see if they can go on to a better, why not let them? Hell, I'm American, yes. I like living in America. I like my freedoms uh, that I get. Um, but if, let's say, I don't know, my brother Jeremy, I don't, for example, wanted to go to, I don't know, Canada. And because he felt that they have better health care or whatever, if he could gain citizenship, if he could. I don't know if he can there, but if he wanted to, he could. I wouldn't stop him. And that's that. So. That won't end well for any of y'all. We've got to try. The white pegasus in the incredible blue mane stated as she held up her pit buck. I assumed she was morning frost. I've got recordings here. You know what? I'm starting to like her, the amber mare next to me stated, echoing the little surge in my own heart. Good girl. What, you saying you're innocent? Tracker sneered. Then why'd you run? Calamity lowered his head and pulled on one of the straps of his battle saddle. The other straps came undone and the whole battle saddle slid to the floor. I don't deny I'm a dash yet, he said. Though the rest of that I take issue with. But then, if I escaped justice, how do you figure they branded me? Yeah, that doesn't make much sense, assessed the yellow mare. Sunglint, I presumed. Maybe the Enclave... lied. Lied? They can't lie to us. Tracker stated... Uh, Tracker stated in the voice he used to take... Uh, Tracker stated in the voice you used to teach basic facts to slow children. They're the government. I sensed Calamity's desire to face off radiating off of him. This enclave. It didn't make sense to me. My own thoughts swam, clutching for an anchor. I realized it was past time to ask my friend about the ponies we were facing. But first I needed to rest. Sleep. More than that. This shows me how ignorant people are. I don't like when people think their government is all the greatest thing. Like, because it's not. No government is perfect. Everyone has a government they believe is right, and everyone has a government they believe is wrong. But in opinion, me, I don't... My own... Well, not all people, but in my opinion, no government is true. No government is the absolute because it always displeases somebody. There's no government that will please everybody and no government that will 
that will have all people. To, uh, sorry, the same goes vice versa when there, there are people well, that hate only this kind of government. Some people like this form of At least one person has to like some form of government. Simple communism or socialism, they, all, they believe that everybody gets an equal amount of pay. That which actually in all reality doesn't make any sense in opinion. Because would it make sense for a doctor to be paid, paid the same as someone who, who takes out trash, who picks up trash? In opinion, I don't think that makes sense. What about this person who has run a multi-million dollar business? He has earned his place there. I, I grew up poor, and I know the feeling of what it's like to, you know, to be you know, at the bottom. But I know that it's only fair. Fair because of that. But not, but not necessarily fair, but fair. Because that's how it's done. That's how the world work. That's how this country works. Communism makes it where everybody who works gets the same pay, but the problem being is that only w their pay is slowly getting lower and lower because some people are just getting lazier and not wanting to do the job they're supposed to do because they're going to get paid either way. That's why. That's also one of the reasons why I don't like the army's pay system because. You are paid every month the same, no matter what. I could be not doing anything for an entire month, and I would still get paid. I'm getting paid to... I can get paid just to sit around, eat, and sleep. I, that's the possibility. Though it's very unlikely for that to happen because I always end up doing something, whether it's, you know, maintenance checks or anything like that. I, or I can do my actual job, which is cooking, which I will be doing soon, by the way, so I should inform you, that no one should judge on a system because everybody wants it somehow. See, I'm not complaining that I get paid every month, even if I do nothing. Because, hey, it's, it's a way of me making income. But that's just the only situation. This is the only situation where America does this. Unless you're... Oh, don't forget teachers. Teachers sometimes get the same concept. Uh, depending on the place, of course. Um, but... No one should be judging other people's form of belief. Like this guy is. No. That. I needed time to breathe. To mourn. My heart was bleeding from many deep wounds. Hurt tomorrow. Help today. But today was tomorrow, wasn't it? I had lost track of the dialogue between the Pegasi. With calamity amongst them, I felt like a poor friend to have done so. I tried to perk my ears and recapture the conversation. After they did nothing about that dragon, the citizens won't stand for them to be passive about the Splendid Valley Massacre, Sunglint was saying. You can't just ignore me. I'm a member of the party, Morning Frost insisted. Last time I follow you two anywhere, Tracker fretted sourly. Friends like you. I gave up my ears plastering against my head. I lifted my gaze to the spinning fan that hung down from the ceiling of absolutely everything and tried to just let everything go. I could hurt today, couldn't I? Cry today. Fight again tomorrow. The first tear stung my eye, then slipped free to roll down my cheek. I tried to blink it back. Not here. I should be alone. Hey... The amber-coated mare spoke, startled. She put a hoof on my shoulder. Hey, 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 don't cry. Please don't cry. I turned to look at her. Look, if you start crying, then I'll start crying, and it'll be a whole messy crying thing. Her voice had a sincerity behind it. I wasn't the only pony hurting, and not the only one trying to hide it. 
I gave her a weak smile. Steelhoofs always hid his pain, the pony in my head reminded me. Steelhoofs was always silently strong for every pony. But that wasn't necessarily a good thing, was it? My soul felt like it was swimming in darkness. Sometimes you need to show a bit of emotion. Sorry, my ear right here is hurting for some reason. I don't know why. But um, in any situation, it's always good to show a bit of emotion. Show a bit. Release it. You never should hold it back. You should, I o you should always let it out. That's why you see me scream a lot. But seriously. Um, but seriously, you should always let it out. Steel Who's bottle it up, but not because he was... I believe Steel Who's bottle it up, not because he wanted to be strong for people. But I think he couldn't do it anymore. Yeah, again, he could be also, but it, but he also could be showing his emotions silently. But he can't exactly show them because of the mask he wears that he can't remove. That's where I'm. That's where I think is going on. Barely treading water, and if I didn't let the tears out, I'd drown in them. Hey, who are you, ponies, anyways? A voice on the far side of the room spoke out. Before any pony could answer, the avalanche started. You're all the Enclave, right? Hey, why y'all attacking us down here? Was Celestia up there? Why'd you take her away? Some ponies were curious, most distraught. There was an ugly undertone building with each question. Now everybody just calm down, Calamity said loudly, raising a hoof. Ain't you one of them, Calamity? Some pony asked poisonously. Calamity stammered. Now, y'all listen here. I heard a thud and a high-pitched yelp. It sounded like it came from the next room. Some pony in the crowd pointed towards me. Past me. Other ponies turned. The steadily raising voices petered out. Ditsy Doo was standing in the doorway. My heart soared just seeing her upright again. It was like she was her own little beam of sunlight. She looked weak frail, like she wasn't quite standing on her own power. Her body canted slightly, making me suspect she was leaning on an invisible zebra. But she was alive, and awake. One of her eyes tilted towards the ceiling fan, but the other stared at the ponies gathered in her shop. Slowly, she lowered her head, dropping her chalkboard on the floor, then rode on it, lifting it back up for every pony to see. Be nice. Absolutely everything reserves the right to buck out ponies who aren't nice. P.S. Healing supplies now for muffins later. Smiles are free. Every pony was... quiet. Then the amber-coated mare, whose name I realized I still hadn't learned, walked up to Ditsy Doo and gave her a thankful hug. Within seconds, Ditsy Doo was being swarmed by ponies, hugging her and professing their thanks and their relief at her recovery. So much so that an invisible zebra was no longer needed to hold her up, nor even able to stand nearby. Can I get you anything? The young amber heroine offered. Soda, squirrel on a stick, anything? Squirrel on a stick, the squirrel My base. first inclination was to decline, but on second thought, water would be nice, thank you. I watched the mare and her friend get up and push their way through the crowd of ponies who had come to see Ditsy Doo. The poor mare was mobbed. Ditsy Doo was alive. She wasn't healthy, not even by any definition that applied to ghouls. But she was alive, and she would continue to live. Probably even make a full recovery, according to Candy. Probably. There was also a good chance she'd never regain full health never quite have the energy and vigor she used to. But she had saved the town, saved her daughter, performed a miracle. As prices went in the equestrian wasteland, this was a small one, easy to bear. You hanging on, little Pip? Calamity asked as he landed next to me. The answer was no, and we both knew it. So instead of lying, I asked, Her senator? Calamity whinnied. I admire her courage, but it's suicide. The Enclave Sky God will have standing orders to shoot him on sight. My friend grimaced in pain. To prevent him from spreading contagion, of course. 
I moaned sadly, closing my eyes. I'm sorry. Can you convince them? Ah, uh, I don't know, Calamity admitted. But I gotta try. Look, little Pip, I need to take off for a little bit. Railrats demanding our new Pegasi friends join him in his office for some polite questioning. I didn't like the sound of that. I intend to be there with him the whole time, Calamity stated with a stomp. Whether the mayor likes it or not. I weakly shifted a leg to touch his breast. Good. Keep him safe. I didn't really expect Railwright to hurt them, but I suspected he wasn't above throwing them in jail for their own protection and I doubted his interrogation would remain friendly without Calamity present. So, what's a senator again? Calamity tilted his hat back. Ah, they're all members of the Senate. Low Council. They make the policies. And the High Council? They enforce the policies. They're the highest judges and generals. Calamity paused, looking at me. Lil' Pip, is this really the best time? I let out a low groan. No, but I needed to know. I needed to understand. There had been a time I had been thankful I didn't know anything about Pegasi politics. But that time was past. It passed when they started killing Wasteland Ponies. My friend frowned, closing his eyes. Folk down here don't have anything like the Enclave. It's not really an easy thing to explain. Much less if some pony lived a whole life in a stable. Railwright's gonna want to know, too. Yeah, I know. Calamity took a deep breath, bulwarking himself. Okay, I know this is gonna sound bizarre to you, but bear with me for a moment. I nodded, listening. I shouldn't be doing this now. I was too tired, too frayed, and too full of butterscotch rum but part of me felt like it was now or never, and part of me thought it might do Calamity some good to explain this to a friend before having to explain it to the mayor. Calamity was silent, his eyes shifting. I could tell he was looking for a place to start. You mentioned something about committees before? I suggested. Okay, yeah, yeah, I can start there. The orange-maned Pegasus said, grasping that. The Enclave runs the Pegasi government through committees. The councils are pretty much just large committees of ponies elected to make national decisions. The councils then appoint smaller committees to handle more localized or specialized... Oh, hell, mostly it just means nothing ever gets done. I was already confused. So, the Enclave? Is that the country, the military, or the government? Calamity laughed wearily, shaking his head. Oh, hell. Flicking his tail, he mentally backed up. Okay, the Enclave is... Well, it's not the country. All Pegasi are citizens, whether they're part of the Enclave or not. All Pegasi get to vote for who they want to represent their cities in the Low Council, and who they want to sit on the High Council. It's just that only members of the Enclave are allowed to run for government positions. And how does a Pegasus become a member of the Enclave? Oh shucks, little Pip. That's an easy part. Calamity smirked. They enlist. So, only ponies who served in the military were qualified for government. I tried to wrap my brain around that, but it made my head spin. The Enclave grew out of an isolationist movement, Pegasi not wanting... I think, I believe, I think Americans have like a little rule saying that non-military personnel can join the, uh, sorry, non-military personnel can become president. There's a rule on that, I think, but which makes no sense because there's an unwritten rule that if the, um, there's a, there's a one rank that hasn't been had for a long time. And it's called the General of the Army. And it's the five-star general. But basically, most of the time, if someone becomes a five-star general, they uh, they usually end up being appointed president later on. It's only happened a few times. Uh, I know the most famous one to be known is uh, President Washington. So, those are my American viewers who 
get that. We might not know that. So, and those of you from a foreign country, there's a little history lesson. <laughs> yeah, so. And, oh, and a government lesson. But here. Need to fight in the war. Hell, I figure they reckon any pony who can survive three years of military education and three months of basic training with my father has the fortitude to help run the country. Uh, the Enclave was quickly ascending to the top of my list of things that made my head hurt. It already surpassed rock farming and was working its way on overtaking train engines. How do you even have a military when there hasn't been a war in 200 years? I blurted, trying to sort through my confusion. Oh, there have been little skirmishes here and there, Calamity noted. The drive to take the Griffin Skies was back in Radar's time, but mostly the military acts as internal security and cloud curtain patrol. I shook my head. I still don't get it. Who's your overmare then? Flashing back to Stable 24, I added. Or over Stallion, if that's what you have. This was a government. A country. Some pony had to be in charge. Some pony had to be the princess. Calamity let out a long sigh. There isn't one, little pip. That's the point. I scrunched my forehead, trying to comprehend that, but it yeah. went against everything I knew about how communities were run. The idea of council sounded a little like Friendship City, but so massive and convoluted that I couldn't build a frame around it. Now, here's this. Everybody has to have a representative in any situation. Yes, you could have a government that runs on basically, like, say, ten people that is all ruling it at the same time. Basically a council. But in opinion, though, you have to have, when you have to deal with other countries, you have to have one, a representative, who is above it all. That way it makes sense. Or, say, a king, such as Queen Elizabeth, or a prime minister. Or a president in our situation, or anything really. That they have to have some sort of rep representative. Calamity glanced over his wings towards the door. Railright was prodding the two ambulatory Pegasi out, while Stiletto stood by Morning Frost's cot. Look, little Pip, I gotta go now. I waved him away. Go, help them. As best you. Sorry, gonna say this. I just suddenly realized how how much this chapter has turned into a fucking government lesson. Oh my god. Can my friend. Calamity rotated, flapping his wings and lifting into the air. The breeze from his wings cooled me. Calamity, I called up to him as he began to move. He stopped, looking back at me. We will fix this, I assured him again. At his pained expression, I admitted. You're right. We can't fix dead, but we can make their deaths meaningful. Ha, ah, little Pip. I don't know, I admitted. Yet. But I promise we will. We can make this the start of something better. Something worth dying for. Calamity smiled. It was a thin smile, but with genuine warmth. I'm gonna hold you to that, little Pip. I smiled to him. My first friend. Thank you. Calamity glanced towards the door. Railright, Tracker, and Sunderland had already left. You know, I'm kind of glad that little Pip still has Calamity right now. Oh yeah, and Homage. But I'm still glad he has them right now. She... She... She has them right now. Sorry, I keep conf sometimes I'm confused because of Craze Rambling's voice. <sighs> but anyway, back. Stiletto was having some difficulty getting Morning Frost maneuvered around the other cots. I watched as Calamity's gaze traveled from cot to cot. The elderly buck who had lost his leg was in here. A colt, his body wrapped in blood-stained bandages, a victim of shrapnel, was crying into his mother's breast. One of the ragged pieces of explosion-torn debris had slashed through his cutie mark, less than a week old. The stallion three cots away was sleeping, heavily sedated. His wife had been there in the street that the Enclave hosed with burning plasma. She was probably one of the burning ponies I had shot out of mercy. The stallion had injured himself badly trying to get close to her, 
but his burns were less painful than the anguish of seeing the pony he loved, screaming in agony, engulfed in plasma fire, of having that image seared into his mind as his last memory of her. For once, I was the least wounded person in the room. But what do we do until then? Calamity asked, not looking back. I bit my lower lip, my body trembling. I could sense the tears coming, but I tried to fight them back. Not here. Not now. We have to do what Steelhose would do, I said. We soldier on. After he left, I stared once again at the ceiling fan, my mind spinning just like its blades. We soldier on. Until we can find the way to make this right, to make things better, we had to endure. We had to persevere. We had to keep helping ponies however we could. It's what Steelhose would have done. Got your water! The Amber Mare's voice rang out as she trotted towards me. I felt the soft impact of the canteen on my chest. I heard a pop and a hiss as she opened a bottle of Sunrise Sarsaparilla for herself. The sound caused a memory to flash through my head. Are we on a date? A memory of Steelhoofs. Goddesses, I missed Steelhoofs so much. And with that, the floodgates blew open. It didn't matter where I was, or who was around me. I curled up and began to cry. Deep, wrenching sobs. For how much a Velvet Remedy was hurting. And Calamity. For Ditsy Doo, who had nearly died. I sobbed for the husband who had lost his wife. The old buck who had lost his leg. The town who had lost the joy of sunlight to bloody battle. I wept for the little filly whose ashes I kept in a cola bottle. And for Star Sparkle. But most of all, I cried for steel hoofs. Swiftly exhausted, Ditsy Doo had moved upstairs with Pyrelite, leaving Silverbell to mine the store, and her griffin bodyguard to mine Silverbell and make sure no pony wandered upstairs after her. While every pony else was preoccupied, Zenith tugged my cot into Ditsy's room, giving me a bit of peace and privacy. Cry today. Rest today. Fight again tomorrow. I had wept for hours. Zenith was keeping vigilant guard at the door, her efforts primarily needed to keep the three young heroes from barging in to try to help. I didn't need or want their help. I wanted to cry some more. I needed to sleep. I was out of tears. My body was exhausted, my mind incoherent. Still, I couldn't fall asleep. I was too tired to sleep. The gears in my mind had become detached, spinning free. And they whirled around in my head at the speed of thought, producing nothing. So many lives were on a razor blade. So many would die while I slept. Red Eye in the Enclave, there was so much to do. Too much for my brain to grasp it. I needed a way to make it right. To make it all matter. I tried to focus, believing that if I could just corral my thoughts, railroad them, then maybe I could finally rest. But my thoughts didn't want to go to happy places. Instead, they returned again and again and again to Splendid Valley, in that little place just beyond its rim. My memories fixed on the sensation of being floated out of the safe room, the super alicorn pulling me to safety. Ditsy Doo had found me. Twilight Sparkle had saved me. At least, I really wanted to believe. She'd stared at my saddlebags. I hadn't really noticed it then, but I recalled that now. She'd seemed fixated on them. In a rush, I suddenly yet absolutely knew that it was Twilight Sparkle, or at least what was left of her riding that alicorn, controlling it. And I knew how she had found me. Be strong, be pleasant, be unwavering, be awesome. She hadn't been saving me. I found myself doubting that what was left of Twilight Sparkle even realized I was there. She was saving her friends. Saving them from a fate that was literally her own. Or maybe, be smart, she had just sensed herself. And in the grip of some nightmarish deja vu, she had come to her own rescue. I couldn't be sure. 
my thoughts slid into more jumbled memories at the sound of erupting earth. Did you find anything this time? Calamity's voice rang out in my thoughts as I pictured Steelhoof's head rolling away from his body. I choked, forcing my mind away, only to have the scene replaced in my mind's eye by Velvet Remedy clinging to Calamity, sobbing. We fight and hurt and bleed to try to make Equestria better. But you can't stop something until you take away its reason for being that way. I couldn't stop the raiders. They were born of the horror and harshness of the wasteland. All I could do was keep killing them until I drowned in their blood. History's greatest mass murderer. Red Eye. The Enclave. Red Eye claimed that he was going to remove himself from the equation. As strange or foolish as it might seem, I believed him. He was an honorable bastard of sorts. But the Enclave. How could I stop something as mighty as a whole army? A whole government, if I understood half of what I thought I knew about them. Only time they can act is when they feel threatened. Ugh. I just wanted to sleep. I was going crazy. Surprisingly, I found myself thinking of Rainbow Dash and remembering the rings of crackling electrified smoke fanning out over the table map of Equestria. That'd start rain. I designed it after the contrails of the Wonderbolts, Rainbow Dash had boasted. Everything about the single Pegasus project goes through me, and it doesn't get my hoof of approval unless it's cool. Start. I wasn't sure why, but my mind caught on that word. Start. I could hear the metallic drumming of rain on the roof of absolutely everything. Start. The store shook at the rumble of overhead thunder. The towers could start rain. Equestria wide if they were ordered to. That meant they could also stop rain. Make it a sunny day. Equestria wide. I felt the gears in my head fitting back into place in a new configuration. A new mental machine building a new picture. Agriculture, you silicone, Radar had stated. Without those towers, the Enclave falls. The only way to stop the Enclave, to save Equestria, was to take control of the Cloud Curtain, peel it back, give sunlight once again to Equestria. Not only would that break their power, it would reveal their lies and show the Pegasi what was really going on down here. That was what the Enclave feared, and for good reason. If the Cloud Curtain was lost, it wouldn't just destroy the Enclave. It would force the Pegasi to return to the surface. They would no longer be able to sustain themselves. Ultimately, it was all about agriculture. The Pegasi would reunite with the Earth Ponies and Unicorns, or try to invade. Judging by the three Pegasi I had seen today, and trusting Calamity's- Is Little Pip suggesting to destroy the towers? Now that makes sense. Destroying the towers would make so much sense to do that. If you think about it, I know I'm defaulting to, to destruction here, but destroying them would do something. Force the Enclave not to... to stop. It would force the Enclave to stop, because they have no power after that. It's word. Most of them would want to help. Even so, it could get really ugly really fast. Red Eye, however, probably considered that acceptable. He had plans for a massive agricultural base in the Everfree Forest, but that was years away from becoming reality. Until then, Ponykind would be struggling to survive on remaining scraps, and who knew if that would be enough. But there was something else. One other chance that Red Eye didn't know about. It wouldn't take an army to stop the Enclave. Just one pony. One expendable pony. A pony who wasn't necessary to make things right again. You've never been forced to give up your principles for the greater good, Red Eye had once told me. To sacrifice yourself and become a monster because it was the right thing to do. Suddenly, I knew it. 
I knew my purpose. Bringing back the sun. Rings of crackling electrified smoke. The pony my head pondered. But what about when the tower stopped the rain and cleared away the clouds? What would that look like? Definitely not the same. Same is boring, Rainbow Dash had once said. At least she had in my dream. Calamity's words echoed through my head. Now I'm thinking about it. Well, there's only one way to clear an area that big that fast. And that's... Now that I think about this, this could also backfire. Hmm. I'm looking at the image I put in there, uh, the friendship, friendship never changes thing. I just realized how much this fits the story by accident. Shit. Like how much it fits the situation because you can see the sun up there. But anyway, back to my point. Think of that. This could backfire in some way. Because this thing helps keep the weather regulated, right? Well, think about it. If she destroys it, what's, what's to say the Pegasus refuse to even do anything? Like, they don't know how to deal with weather. What? Because they might not actually have weather up there. Because they're already above clouds. What if they don't have weather? They're on clouds, so it doesn't matter to them anymore. So, what's to say none of them know how to do it? We don't know that. Oh, I don't. K-Cat knows. But... Meaning... There's no rainfall. Turning the entire wasteland... Keeping the wasteland dead. Making it where it can't grow anymore. Eventually, the sun will dry out all the water, making everyone lose their ability to drink. Making it where there is no water, the earth will start to crumble. It will start to dehydrate. It will start to evaporate. Just, in fact, the clouds probably won't even fall right. Like, I don't think there'll be any clouds after that. Because th those, actually, now that I think about it, the weather would probably affect itself because think about the Everfree Forest. Their clouds move on their own. They could affect the same way because the Everfree Forest is a wild place and it turned the and eventually the Balefire bombs turn Equestria into a wild place. So it could react the same way now I think about it. So I so strike my theory. I'm just going to say that now. That's with a sonic rain boom. Despite my weariness, I bolted upright. Sunshine and rainbows. Well, I'll be damned. Somewhere in the other room, a rush of excited voices rose and fell, followed by some pony turning up Ditsy Doo's radio loud enough to distort the voice of DJ Pony. Back, children, but not for long. So there's a few things I gotta tell you about. First, our hearts and prayers go out to the folks of Friendship City, and every pony who had relatives there. Late yesterday, and the most horrific attack yet, the airborne plague calling themselves the Enclave brutally slaughtered Friendship City. The city's gone, children. Hundreds of ponies dead. If you didn't believe me before, believe me now. The Enclave ain't here to save any pony. They ain't our friends. But I'm not bringing you a dark cloud without a silver lining, children. Here's the good news. The ponies of the Equestrian Wasteland are standing up against them. And I'm not just talking about our bringer of light, although she's been right in the thick of it. When the Enclave came for Friendship City, she struck back at them. Thanks to our Wasteland heroine, the Enclave lost everything they threw at Friendship City. And more importantly, a couple hundred ponies survived the attack. But she ain't the only hero standing strong against the Enclave. Remember those renegade Steel Ranger outcasts I told you about? Well, they call themselves Applejack's Rangers now. And even as I speak, the Applejack's Rangers are working round the clock to ferry survivors off of Friendship Island, protecting them on the way to new homes. Where can they find new homes, you might ask? The answer is, everywhere they go. 
Even that normally stuffy Ten Pony Towers opened its doors to refugees. After a hoofful of unicorns rose up and kicked the Enclave Sar tails out of their tower. Yeehaw! Score one for the good ponies. And I've got more reports coming in. Heroes all the way from Shattered Hoof to Hoofington have been holding the line against the nightmares from above. I have a tale here of two such heroes, taking down one of those warships just south of Stalingrad. Left a calling card, Lion and Mouse. Well, tell you what, Lion and Mouse, drop by Ten Pony sometime. As soon as my assistant is back from her vacation, I'd love to have a sit down with you for an interview. And to the griffins and ponies who fought off the Enclave at Shattered Hoof, damn fine work. But the biggest strike against the Enclave has come from none other than our own beloved author of the Wasteland Survival Guide, Ditsy Do. You all saw it. Hell, I could see that glow all the way from Shattered Hoof Ridge. We don't even have a name for what the Wasteland's favorite Pegasus managed to do this morning. Sonic Rad Boom, Toxic Rain Boom. Wait. Well, whatever you. She just gave it. off a position. She gave off her position just now. If they listen to that, they know where she is. Shadow Hoof Ridge. I call it a miracle. So do I, love. Now, don't worry, children. I know I just kind of let my location slip. But the Enclave already knew. I saw a whole murder of them flying this way from the tower monitors before I started broadcasting. They'll be at the door any moment. And I don't think they plan on inviting me to tea. But don't worry about me neither. I'm not a fighter. Never really have been. Not even when I was a wasteland explorer. I was more of a hacker and repair pony myself. Fixing things up and building off schematics. Making the technologies and magic of the old world work for me. I can barely shoot a gun. But that doesn't mean I'm just going to lay down and let them take me. Any chance of sleeping evaporated at those words. I lay in my cot, no. my nerves crackling. No! straining to hear every word. No! Every background sound that came over the radio. It took me a moment to remember my own ear bloom and tune into the broadcast on my own pit buck leg thing. So, two things before I leave you again. First... I want to dedicate this broadcast to the late Elder Steelhoofs, founder of the Applejacks Rangers. I know, with all the death we've seen, it might seem odd to single one pony out. But Steelhoofs wasn't just any pony. Steelhoofs was a hero, a protector of ponies. He put his life on the line saving others, and he inspired other ponies to do the same. A whole legion within the Steel Rangers broke away to follow his example. Steelhoofs was a companion to our wasteland heroine as well. She was strong with him at her side. Her victories were often his victories as well. When I first met Steelhoofs, he was making sure Chief Grimstar died a hero in the eyes of the ponies under his care. I came to know him fairly well over the last few weeks. Of course she had, I thought. She'd watched my memories. Now I'll tell you the truth. Steelhoofs was not without his flaws. He was not always a good pony. He meted out justice as he saw fit, and I didn't exactly agree with whom he chose to play judge and executioner. But that is the harsh law of the equestrian wasteland. But he never faltered. He held true to his love and his principles, fighting until the day he died. Steelhoofs had lived an impossibly long life. His death was swift, painless, and in battle. It was the death I believe he would have wanted. And now, it's our turn. To hold true. To fight. And to never falter. I think we should all die the way we want. I know we don't, not all of us want to die, but it's inevitable anyway. We cannot avoid death. No matter how healthy you are, no matter how much you eat right or exercise, we're all going to die in the end. And here's this. I believe once we die, I think we should at least have a way we want to die. The way Steel Hoof probably wanted was to probably die in battle defending, defending other people's lives. Me, I want to die hilariously. 
That's that. I want to die in a way that it's funny. In fact, in my death, I want, like, some of my ashes, yeah, in a terminal way to play to be put, placed under a tree, an apple tree, so I can feed my descendants. And another part of my ashes to be kept in an urn that has a sensor module on it. And when it, when anybody passes by it, a motion, well, mo mainly a motion sensor, and anyone passes by it, it starts playing Burn Baby Burn. Or, another one even better, Highway to Hell. See, I want my death to be hilarious. See, um, and I believe everybody should choose to die in a funny way. Sorry, not, not a funny way, but in a, die in the way they choose how they want to die. Like, I, when I was younger, I had a, a very funny idea was to, was to be, have a tire hit me in the face. <laughs> like a tire flying off a car and just... You know? Or uh, sleeping in the shower and I'd be so pruned up they couldn't tell whatever it was a man or a beanbag chair. Uh, but... But that was the ideas I came up with. And this is the... I know this is um, really sad, but... I think everybody should be able to die in their own way. In the way they want. Like... Yeah, dying of old age is the most best thing you can have, but into whose eyes? Yeah, not that privilege. Tears trickled down my cheeks. I was weeping again. And with that, children, I have a confession to make. This broadcast is not exactly live. And I've got a message for the black armored soldiers who just burst into the station at the Shattered Hoof Ridge Tower. That thing you're looking at with the glowing blue light. A little homebrewed surprise rigged to a spark battery from a weapon made from the motherfucking stars. Farewell, you. The broadcast cut off with an abrupt blast of static. It wasn't replaced by on Oh, thank you. <laughs> that took me off guard there. Like, I didn't expect that. Like, it was pre-recorded and everything, and so she made that, did that, and fucked those guys. She just fucked them. Yes! Go homage! Waves were just dead silent. And they remained so for the longest ten minutes the equestrian wasteland had ever experienced. From the cotton ditzy dude's room, I had only the darkness and homage's words to hold me. I could not know that my love had struck the deepest, most vital blow against the Enclave yet. I didn't realize Amwich had pulled the entire power supply from that alien weapon and rigged it to a bomb. I didn't see the brilliant blue explosion that obliterated more than just the base of the station and the dozen heavily armored Enclave Pegasi inside. For two hundred years, the nearly fifty towers of the single Pegasus project had stood, impervious to everything the enemy and the wasteland could throw at them. I was not a witness on that snow-swept ridge as one of those towers cracked, shifted, and came tumbling down. I awoke, disoriented by the sense of having lost time. I didn't remember falling asleep, but my body was rested. I could get up, walk around again, and I did so. The metallic pattering of the rain sizzled the air above me. The ghosts of dreams returned to me faded and fragmented, dreams of sunshine and sonic radbooms. I was hungry, and thirsty. I had a slight headache, and I needed to relieve myself. Stumbling into the store, I was surprised to find it devoid of medical cots. Instead, the store had been taken over by the Griffins. Outside, thunder rumbled. Gaudina Grimfeathers was talking to Ditsy Doo's bodyguard. There were two smaller griffins present, adolescents if I was sizing them up right, similar enough in build and stature to make me suspect they were twins. One of them was talking to Calamity, a discussion that seemed to focus on a pair of odd pistols she carried in her holster strapped to her breast. She had one of them out and open, holding it carefully in her talons for Calamity's inspecting eye. The griffin was of similar build to the god, but slimmer, and would definitely be appealing if it weren't for the suspicion that she was at least five years younger than me. I could tell she grew up to be very pretty. If the waste. I like how her. Little Pip doesn't see a uh, race. 
at all. It's not just race, but species. She's like literally attracted to anything female. <laughs> that is an abomination. <laughs> it gets me. She's attracted to pony, all kinds of ponies. She's attracted to all kind. Uh, she's attracted to zebras. She's attracted to apparently griffins. <laughs> wow. I wonder what else she's into. The other griffin was leaning against the shop counter. A bemused expression on his beak as Silver Bell tried to sell him one random item after another. He had apparently already bought an iron, three billiard balls, and an empty tin can just to keep the little filly happy. Ditsy Doo was hovering over the workbench, literally, working on something that looked a lot like my Canterlot police barding. At my appearance, she scooped up the barding, taking her chalkboard in her mouth, and fluttered over to me. The ghoul pegasus offered me the barding. It was indeed my armor, but Ditsy had repaired and reinforced it, making it stronger and more protective than before. Her chalkboard read, it was looking a bit shot up. I blushed. Thanks. How much do I owe you? Ditsy do seemed to laugh. She set down the chalkboard, rubbing it clean with a hoof, then wrote, No charge. The Wasteland heroine wears armor by Ditsy do. Your good advertisement. The ghoul smiled at me. The smile was grim, showing too many teeth and too much of her gums. But I felt the warmth. You know, I always thought Ditsy was too good. <laughs> now she's using her best friend as advertisement, which is kind of way kind of devious, but I like that. That's a pretty good idea. I love it. Of it. She wanted to help. The advertising was just an excuse. I threw my forehooves around her, giving the ghoul a squishy hug. She tensed a moment, then hugged back. Squishily. You're a good friend, I whispered to her. And a good pony. One of the best this world has to offer. Thank you. She pulled back and looked at me oddly. Then shook her head and pointed a hoof at my chest. My guess was that she was saying, Not me, you. Either that or she was starting an impromptu game of tag. Before I could respond, Silver Bell ran up, her little horn glowing with a faint silver light as she floated a small pile of bottle caps up to Ditsy Doo. Look, Mommy, I made a set. In opinion, I think Ditsy is just as good as Pip. Don't take that the wrong way, but I mean is she is just as good, even though she doesn't help as many ponies as Pip. But... She has done things that nobody else could. She has saved lives. That Sonic Radboom saved a few lives, I think. Does it? I think so. Uh, but either way, she, he helped. She's, she did something amazing. She adopted a child. She became something more. She helps people in more ways than one. She wrote the Wasteland Survival Guide, which most likely, guys, actually helped tons of people. You gotta think about that, man. Sail. A gentle, crystalline melody, like the chiming of dozens of silver bells, wafted through the store. Calamity approached me, followed by the young griffin woman with the pistols. Little Pip, you're awake. Part of me wanted to run to him and tell him I had a plan. That I had somehow had an epiphany, and I knew just what we needed to do. What I needed to do. It wouldn't make everything right, but it would be a massive start. But I wasn't quite ready yet. I needed more information. I needed to know how the Enclave was going to react to what happened here, to what Ditsy Do had done. And I really needed to pee. How long was I out for? I asked, noticing a lack of light through the windows. The store shook slightly with another rolling percussion of thunder. The thudding in my head grew a little worse. Mm, about twelve hours, Calamity admitted. Most of a day. I needed to take care of a few things. I needed to borrow a bathroom and maybe some painkiller. But before I could excuse myself to care for either, Calamity wrapped a ring around me and ushered me towards the two younger griffins. You'll never guess who. Uh, I said uncomfortably. 
Little Pip, this is Cage and Reggie, he said, pointing to the male griffin first. He smiled wryly as he put his newly purchased tin can into his saddlebags. Cage, Reggie, this here is Little Pip. I lifted a hoof in a timid wave. Bring her a lad and heroine of the wastelands. My hoof dropped as my face went red. I hated calamity so much right then. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say old Derpy did more light bringing today than you, little Pip. Cage chuckled, offering a set of talons. I hesitated, feeling both embarrassed and vaguely offended to hear someone other than a small colt use that nickname, even though Calamity once told me she found it endearing. I lifted my hoof, and he shook it with merciful gentleness. I lifted my hoof, and he shook it with merciful gentleness. A good thing, too, since his talons were painfully sharp, even in gentle grasp. I drew my hoof back, checking for spots of blood. Sure, he could have taken my hoof off if he had wanted to. I shifted my attention to the pretty young griffin, extending my hoof with a slight wince. I felt myself blushing slightly more. Cage and Regina Grimfeathers, Calamity whispered into my ears. I froze, my jaw dropping open. Yeah, that's right, Reggie smirked. I could see Cage already rolling his eyes. We're the children of God. God has kids? A little pony in the back of my head started running around in circles, I protesting. I did not know that. Fuck. And if I was supposed to remember that, I am sorry. That took me off guard right there. That's why they I probably look like God. I was not checking out your daughter. I was definitely not checking out your daughter. My gaze shifted up to Godina, who was now talking to both Ditsy and the other griffin. Ditsy Doo was holding up one of her chalkboards. I couldn't see the writing. And God was answering. <laughs> Well, I can't rightly go charge in the town for protection if we don't show up to protect it. Now, can I? Gaudina is running a protection racket on New Appaloosa. That comes with actual protection? The little pony in my head chuckled affectionately. That is so Gaudina. Loyal to the contract. Of course, I hadn't been looking at Regina like that. She was a little young for me. Not to mention she was a griffin. Well, God's a griffin my little pony pointed out. Okay, sure. I once found Gaudine to be fanciful for a griffin, but that was before homage, and I was really to? lonely Will at the you, time. Question, before homage, were you willing to fuck her? I wouldn't be surprised. My eyes took in the griffin as if trying to assure myself that it was just a passing fancy. Yes, she was strong, and beautifully built, and the scars really did add to her presence, and apparently I really liked older mares, the pony in my head taunted. But Gaudina didn't look old. First Velvet, my little pony jabbed, now Mommy Griffin. I wanted that little pony to shut up so badly. You basically just basically called God a MILF. Pip, you just called God a MILF. Godina wasn't old. Adult, yes, but... What, did she have them when she was three? Not old. She still looked vigorous and built and... Ah, uh, did I just not have any sense of age when it came to griffins? Oh. My. God. Regina exclaimed loudly, taking her mother's name in vain, like only a teenager could. Little Pip's hot for Ma. Luna's moaning moon heat. That burning in my cheeks exploded over my entire body. Oh my god. No, I... But... I saw Gaudina looking back at me with her eyebrow lifted high over her good eye. Are you kidding me? I collapsed to the floor in pure embarrassment, trying to bury my head underneath of my hooves. Kill me now, Wasteland. 
Any second now. <laughs> oh my god! And here I was gonna say your boyfriend was waiting for you outside. God called over to me, mercifully giving me the excuse to dash out into the rain like I was being pursued by a pack of hellhounds. I leaned against the train engine that made up part of the hodgepodge construction of absolute- How did she figure that out? Was she talking aloud? Everything. It was dark, during the dead hours of the early morning. That hour where the darkness lays most heavily on the soul, and the hungry monsters outside claw at your door. Rain poured down around me, turning the street into rivers, washing away the radiation and the blood. The lights of New Appaloosa cut beams through the rainfall, making the falling water shimmer and shine in the blackness. Water spilled from the rooftops, and gurgled down gutters to splash into overfilled rain barrels. I was quickly soaked to the bone. No pony was outside. My utter devastating humiliation took a back seat to the need to pee. I trotted around to the side of the building, glancing around to make sure I wasn't watched, and started to relieve myself into a little streamlet. Hello, little Pip, a voice said from absolutely nowhere, about two yards in front of me. I jumped back, my heart trying to leap out of my chest. Embarrassment, annoyance, and shock fought each other for dominance as I recognized the mechanical voice of Watcher. Watcher, what the fuck, oh, man? sorry, I'll just be over here. A little late for that, Watcher, I grumble shouted. Damn it, I should have used my eyes forward sparkle to check the area. With a deep sigh, I brought up my EFS and located the sprite bot. You all right? I asked. Might as well talk to him. It wasn't like I was going to be able to finish after that anyway. Me? Yes, but... Watcher sounded hesitant. I wanted to make sure you were okay. And guilty. Are you? There were so many ways the answer to that question should have been no. But instead, I chose to cut to the chase. What's wrong? Watcher was silent for a minute, the sprite bot bobbing in the rain. I goofed up, little Pip. My mind strained, trying to imagine a huge, ferocious dragon saying the word goofed. But this was Spike. I've put you in grave danger. I closed my eyes. Danger wasn't exactly new to me. What happened? Somewhere behind me, I heard a door open and close. Little Pip! Calamity called into the night. I lifted a hoof, motioning for Watcher to hold his thought. Over here! I called to Calamity. The Sprite Bot waited silently until Calamity had trotted up next to me his hoof splashing in the streamlet that I had been using just a couple minutes ago. The Enclave has security footage of you guys in the Ministry of Awesome, and High General Harbinger managed to get a transmission out of Maripony before it went up. They've put two and two together. Not exactly unexpected. And was I the only pony who found it exasperatingly wrong that High General was an elected position? Watcher continued. The Enclave has sent their best hit squad after you and your friends. Oh, hell. Calamity moaned. Who? I asked. The Wonderbolts. Watcher informed us. I blinked. Wait. Who? The Enclave had named their best pack of hunters the Wonderbolts. There was something in my heart. Be awesome that wanted to kick their asses just for using that name. That is so wrong. No. 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 Don't you dare, Enclave. Hell no. Did I just get ghetto for a second? It gets worse. Watcher admitted. One of the Enclave Skyguard ponies who saw you two in my cave was a junior member of the Wonderbolts. He recognized you, Calamity. They came to my cave. Mm, gut shot, Calamity muttered. I remembered the Pegasus. That's a dead shot Calamity, winner of the best young sharpshooter competition four years running. 
You don't forget the pony who beat you. One of the Wonderbolts. Oh, I so wanted to awesomely stomp them. Was second only to Calamity as a sharpshooter. And Calamity never missed. My eyes widened in sudden alarm. Spike! I gasped, There's a green forgetting arrow myself. Of this universe. Your cave! Did they... No, 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 no. Please don't let the Enclave have destroyed the gardens of Equestria. It's safe, Spike said through the sprite bot, filling me with relief. But, well, you understood why I had to get them out of there as quickly as possible, don't you? His voice, even though synthetically manufactured, still managed to sound plaintive. Calamity exhaled a long sigh. Ugh, what'd you tell him, Spike? And I've never been very good at being interrogated, Spike continued. What did you tell him, Spike? No. Calamity said sternly. Nothing much, really, just... Spike paused, as if stealing himself. I told them you had been in iron shot firearms. Calamity blinked. Huh? It was an old weapons factory, I told him. I met Watcher outside of it once, long time ago. I asserted even as I realized it wasn't that long ago. Two months, maybe. But those two months have been a lifetime. It was before I met you. Okay. Calamity pondered. Then, I don't get it. So what? But I knew what Spike was worried about. My mind flashing back to when I had learned... My mind was flashing back to when I had learned the Steel Rangers were after Stable 2, and my fears that it was somehow my fault. That when I had hacked the door to Stable 29, I had left something behind. I was a lot less careful, or experienced, back at Iron Shot Firearms. I had hacked into that office computer like a careless amateur. I left my virtual hoofprints all over it. How technically proficient are the Wonderbolts? I asked slowly. Calamity frowned, shifting his position. Well, that depends. He took a deep breath and addressed the sprite bot. Do the Wonderbolts still have wind shear and lens flare? Who? I questioned, figuring they were names I might need to know. Calamity rustled his wings. Wind shear is my eldest brother, the rust colored Pegasus told me, adding, Dad's favorite. Master of Communication Technologies, top of his class. Graduate and graduated with honors, made corporal, member of the Wonderbolts. He shook his head. Only one of us Dad ever seemed to approve of. But then, why wouldn't it be Dad's favorite? I winced. And Lens Flare? When she is best friend, rival, and occasional lover, Calamity said. Expert repair pony, especially when it comes to magical energy weapons. Taught me a few tricks I used to build the Nova Surge rifles in my Enclave armor. I'm gonna let it pass. Also top of his class, focused in Arcano Tech. Ah, crap. We were in trouble. First and foremost, how could we go to war against Calamity's big brother? And then again, considering what I had seen of his family so far, pummeling the buck might be highly therapeutic. When she left the Wonderbolt several years ago, Watcher told us, immediately making me feel much better about the situation. Followed by other promotions according to the press release. Press release? I questioned. Calamity leaned close and whispered, The Wonderbolts are the stars of the Enclave. Spend as much time putting on shows at patriotism events as they do actually hunting. He added, Probably more. Celebrities the best hunter-killer pack in the Enclave. They tracked down and murdered ponies for a living. And they had fans. They put on shows. Ponies lined up for their autographs. There were <sighs> press releases when... It's perverting the name! It's perverting the name! Where they had a roster change. How fucked up was that? But Lens Flare is still with them. He was one of the Pegasi who visited my cave yesterday. My face fell. 
We were dead. Calamity saw my expression. Lil Pip. They can get my tag from the computer and iron shot firearms, I told him. My voice resigned. And as soon as they do, they'll be able to use their armor to locate me no matter where I go. I'm sorry, little Pip, Spike said remorsefully. But you can just take your Pip Buck off, right? Lead them astray? I lifted my foreleg, showing the Sprite Bot how my Pip Buck had become grossly melted to my body. A watcher had the wits to say nothing. Well, I could just cut my leg off, I thought out loud. I might even regrow it. Or I could just leave. Draw them away. I looked at Calamity. Try and keep you all safe. Oh, hell no. Calamity gave a stomp. Nothing doing, little Pip. We're sticking together. But... But nothing, Calamity said sternly. Then he smiled. Besides... I got myself a plan. Calamity grinned, poking my nose with a hoof. Just trust me on this one, little bait. Oh no. Oh no, 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 no. This wasn't going to end well. You're gonna use Pip as bait? The fuck was that? Ugh. Well, anyway, guys, I hope you guys enjoyed this awesome episode of Fallout Equestria, and I hope you guys did, too. And, wait, I just realized I was redundant. I, I hope you guys enjoyed this one like I have. That's a better way to say it. I was redundant with that. I hope I don't do that. I, haven't, I hope I haven't done that in the past. Yeah. Well, either way, guys, this was an interesting episode. This also leaves a whole new set of questions and answers that can be... Let it on to it. Let on later. Like, how is she going to d deal with the towers? Is she going to destroy them, hack them, or take a take control and take control of them, or what? And second of all, how are they going to deal with the wonder bolts? Well, anyway, um, I'll catch you guys later. Stay nerdy, my friends. Bye.